All right. Hello, everybody. I'm so happy to see you all. Well, I can't see you all, but you know what I mean. Um, my name is Brianna Coma, and I am from Conservation Nebraska. Thank you again so much for being with here, being here with us tonight. And I'm excited to learn more with Bob about edible wild plants. A couple of reminders as we're all trickling on in here. Your cameras are all muted and your wow, I cannot talk tonight. I'm mixing everything up. Your mics are all muted and your cameras are off, so you cannot be seen or heard. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to throw them in the chat box or the Q&A, and we'll get to them either at the end or through the presentation. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so if you miss anything or if you want to share it with anybody, feel free to check it out in a couple of weeks on Conservation Nebraska's YouTube channel. And lastly, there will be a short pre and post quiz that pops up on your screen um, in just a second. Um, that just helps Conservation Nebraska to improve on our future webinars and events. And if you complete both the pre and post, you will be entered into a prize pool for a $25 gift card. So make sure to do the one right now and then there'll be another one at the end and there are only a couple questions so they're super short and easy but now we will get into it um tonight we have bob hendrickson with us he is the horticulture program coordinator with nebraska statewide arboretum which is a program of the nebraska forest service bob also hosts a live calling gardening talk show called how's it growing on local radio station in lincoln um, so I will hand it on over to you, Bob, to get us started. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I, hopefully you can hear me okay, everyone. I'm glad you took the time to uh, tune in this evening uh, in this cold Wednesday evening in Nebraska. We'll, we'll warm things up and, and think of things green here. Um, if you were not able to catch uh, part one of uh, Wild Edible Plants of Nebraska. You can find it on YouTube. On YouTube, just uh, type in Wild Edible Plants of Nebraska and you'll find uh, the first uh, presentation uh, we did as part of this series. And there's always so many plants to talk about. Um, I'll do my best to try to make it through them all. But uh, this second part will also be available on YouTube once Brianna gets that done and you'll be able to watch it on, to your own leisure. So, you know, there's some slides that have maybe more words on it than I would like, but that is designed for you to be able to watch it again and, and slow things down and, and, and look things up on your own because uh, everything I'm talking about tonight, uh, there's lots of great information online for you to look up these plants and learn more about them so you can include them as part of your, your wild edible plant foraging. So thanks for tuning in. Let's get, let's get busy with it. And uh, well, for some reason, it's not able to advance for me. Why is it not advancing? There we go. Um, okay, so yeah, we'll do a shameless plug again for How's It Growing. Uh, today, I was on the show uh, when, every Wednesday, 11 till noon on KZUM. Uh, if you're in Lincoln, that's 89.3 FM, or you can uh, tune in anywhere online in the world at kzum.org. And uh, it's a gardening talk show, and we talk a lot about wild edible plants. In fact, that's, that's us uh, doing a foraging uh, walk in uh, Wilderness Park, uh, showing people some wild edible plants. And we're going to be doing that again in April of this year. So uh, uh, be looking out for that. I think it's April 9th we decided to do it this year. Anyway, this is a quote from Kay Young. Kay Young is, uh, has a book called Wild Seasons. And I couldn't agree with this more. The great thing about collecting wild plants, we're not looking at this as a survival food, even though someday we might, right? You never know. <laughs> but uh, this is tasty stuff. It's not just survival food, meaning you can hardly stomach the, the, the flavor of it. This is gourmet fare uh, that rivals the gourmet fare anywhere in the world, as Kay Young said. And she has a great book called Wild Seasons. It's kind of my Bible. And, uh, you know, they're nutritious, they're tasty. But the best thing about gathering is it gets you out into nature. I think a lot of us are looking for reasons to get out into nature more, kind of slow down and recharge our batteries. This gives you an excuse to get out into nature, to discover, explore, and learn about uh, wild edible plants. You know, while you're out in nature, why not hunt for something, right? And it's in our innate human nature to gather as hunters and gatherers, right? So this is the gathering part of that. You can grow a lot of these plants in your backyard. 
But I think what the foraging wild plants does is it teaches you to kind of be in season and eat in season and uh, look forward to that season. And I swear there's not a day that could go by during the growing season, heck, even in the winter time months, uh, that you couldn't harvest something or forage something from nature. So it's a pretty cool thing. And I think the understanding of wild things uh, helps us to, to make better choices. Uh, to help protect our natural systems. If we find more value in those natural systems for wild edible plants, why not protect something that we can utilize, right? This is a quote from Melvin Gilmore uh, way back in 1914. Melvin Gilmore was a professor here at the University of Nebraska. And uh, he was uh, one of our first prairie ecologists. Uh, Melvin Gilmore, uh, I love this uh, quote from him. Uh, we have large tracts of land in America. This bounty is wasted because the plants that can be grown are not acceptable to people. So that's what this is all about, introducing us to plants that use, used to be utilized, but for some reason aren't anymore. And we need to get back to that. There's some great references out there for you. Uh, there's Kay Young's book in the lower left there, Wild Seasons. That's a good reference for you to start in Nebraska and all these available online. Samuel Thayer is a big name in the wild edible plants world, has some great books out there. Um, and then Alan Burjo, uh, Lita Meredith, all great books for you to include in your, your reference guide for wild edible plants. And then we have great blogs and websites out there. All of these are awesome. Uh, for me in particular, I tend to find myself eating a lot that are going to that grow, forage, cook, ferment. Uh, as you see towards the bottom there, that's a real good one. They're all good though. So uh, lots of great information for you to learn more about wild edible plants out there in the world. Okay, so we're just going to get started with the plants here. And uh, first of all, I'm just going to talk about some uh, edible wild plants that we can either grow in the garden or find in the wild. Uh, this is one of my favorite prairie plants, the purple poppy mallow. It's also called wine cups uh, for good reason. The, uh, the, the, it's in the hollyhock family, so you can kind of see it kind of looks like a hollyhock if you squint your eyes, but each one of the flowers kind of has that white eye in the middle of it. But the flowers, the, the root, the leaves, the whole plant is edible. And I don't think a lot of people realize that with purple poppy mallow, that the plant is edible. And you can see somebody planted new plants right uh, along that retaining wall there. You can see the plants right at the top of them. And as those plants grow, that is just newly planted, they will sprawl over that retaining wall and kind of hide that edge. And, and yet they're very tough drought tolerant plants, so they shouldn't need any care from us humans. So it's a great choice. You can see there's that kind of that sprawling nature uh, that the plant has. It, it forms a, a dense tap root, and in the center of that plant, if you can see my arrow, we can't see the, the tap root, but then the, the branches kind of sprawl out from that central tap root and can, can form a patch around three by three feet wide. So you can see there's a whole lot of foliage on there. And it's a great plant for nature lovers because it's a food plant. Uh, these butterflies here, the gray hair streak, the check, checkered skipper and the white check skipper, all lay their eggs on this plant and the larvae uh, then eat that plant. Um, so the plant is, is specific to the, uh, those three butterflies. So that's pretty cool. And uh, the flowers open in the full sun and then they close at night, but uh, it's a great pollinator plant too. They attract bees and butterflies and other insects just feeding on the nectar and the pollen. So the leaves of this plant um, by Native Americans and settlers were used as a soup thickener, much like you would use okra. Okra is also in the mallow family, so it has kind of that mucilaginous juice in it, this plant. You can eat the leaf fresh and it's just kind of green, you know, it doesn't really have much flavor to it, but putting it in your soups, it will act as a thickener and kind of thicken that soup a little bit. And so very easy to use the leaves for that. And as you can see, they sprawl spreading over the ground, but sometimes they'll, they'll grow onto your path, but they're easily cut back to kind of keep them in bounds. But here's what Samuel Thayer, that author that I was telling you about, had to say about it. Uh, a brief acquaintance with this robust root vegetable makes one wonder why it is not one of our best known native foods. And I think one of the reasons it's not the best known is because it's so beautiful. You know, who would want to go dig up that lovely plant, right? But if you start to cultivate some of these plants in your garden with the intent that I'm going to get seedlings and then let those seedlings grow up and then I'm going to harvest some of those plants, you can actually harvest the root like this 
and then cut off that crown much like you would harvest horseradish and then replant the crown of that plant for it to grow back. And that's how it was traditionally harvested by Native Americans late in the fall when all that energy of the plant is going into that root. That root is uh, can be up to four inches across uh, the size of a, a parsnip. And um, you can eat the root raw. I've tasted it raw. It's, it's, it's actually quite sweet and tasty. But, you know, we really don't eat potatoes raw, right? We cook them. And one of the best ways to eat uh, the purple poppy mallow is by roasting it over an open fire, boiling it. And, but it was traditionally eaten uh, uh, roasted. But you can see those roots get really big. And the Dakota Indians would actually burn the root and inhale the smoke to relieve uh, bronchial congestion. And it actually had the name it translated into smoke treatment medicine. And I have not uh, partaken in that yet, but it's something I'm certainly interested in. And, and of course, the smoke and the tea made from the boiled roots were also used to relieve pain. So uh, poppy mallow is a cool plant. But you can see the size of that root um, uh, is a storage organ. These plants will store uh, water, sugar, starches in these roots uh, as a, uh, a way to overcome drought conditions. So we may have a five-year drought. Well, if you're storing all that water in that, in that thickened root, uh, you have a plant the next year guaranteed. Okay, so we'll move on from purple poppy mallow to common milkweed. Um, this is a, a, a plant you have to get to know more uh, for your wild edible foraging because it's one of the best. Um, and, you know, I know some people might be concerned about uh, harvesting that this is the common milkweed, the wild milkweed you'll traditionally see in road ditches and in waste areas, or at least you used to before its habitat has been kind of hammered. But people who harvest milkweed aren't going to be the ones to kill it off because when we harvest milkweed, we're not digging the plant. We're snipping off the tips of the plant and the plant recovers and grows just fine. You're, not, you're gonna value the, meat, the milkweed not only for the monarchs, but as a food source. So you'll be most likely interested in preserving places where the milkweed grows, not destroying it, right? Which is the real killer of milkweed and the monarchs is destroying habitat. So there's what the common milkweed looks like. And if you've ever stuck your nose in that cluster of flowers, you know how deliciously scented it is. But this is the season where you get excited about milkweeds when they're first emerging in the spring. That's what they look like as the leaves are unclasping from that thick stem. You're looking at about an eight inch tall plant. That's a perfect time to be harvesting these new shoots. And you can just kind of snip away those new shoots with your forefinger and thumb or use a, a, a scissors or a pruners or whatever to cut them back. And then you're not gonna hurt the plant at all. It will completely recover from you cutting it back and send up new shoots. Um, uh, for the plant to grow uh, the rest of the season. So this is the time of year to harvest the milkweed shoots when the leaves uh, are just unfolding. And then you take those young milkweed shoots and you can prepare them and you can blanch them, you can roast them. Um, and you can see the leaves you kind of save off to the side here. And now you've got these, these stems that you can kind of leave those top leaves if you want and, and prepare them for cooking. And you can blanch them much like you would cook asparagus and honestly, it kind of tastes like a green bean meets an asparagus, I would describe the flavor as. You know, maybe you blanch it in boiling water, salted water for 30 seconds, drain it, and then transfer it to a pan with a little butter, a little garlic, a little salt and pepper, and stir fry it for a minute or so. And then, you know, you don't want to overcook it much like asparagus, right? You don't like overcooked asparagus. You don't want it to be mushy um, and just a little al dente. And they're tasty and delicious and good for us as well. You can make a lot of different things with these milkweed shoots. Uh, the, the, the top left, that milkweed shoot frittata sounds delish. And as you can see, they arrange the shoots to make it look real pretty. If you've ever never have made a frittata yet, you're missing out because they're so easy and a great egg dish for your, your Sunday morning breakfast or whenever. You can roast the milkweed shoots. They're great over an open fire or on your grill. Uh, once you cook the milkweed shoots, because you do have to cook them first, um, you can, you know, have them in a salad or again, uh, sauteing them like I showed you having as a side dish for your stir fry. They're just a very versatile thing, the, the mil milkweed shoots when they're emerging in the spring. Then those large leaves that you, you took off the stalks, you can save those leaves and chop them up and cook them separately. You can braise them until they're soft and tender. Um, and then those cooked young leaves puree very easily, which you can add to a spring tart like this milkweed spring tart or to dips, or you can whip up some snazzy green milkweed leaf pasta dough 
And honestly, it doesn't really have much flavor, but um, you know, it just adds a nice pizzazz to your pasta dough. Um, and then just kind of fun to do to something to do to save leaves. And I have heard that the Winnebago tribe often made a something similar to cream of broccoli soup, but they made that soup using the milkweed leaves. With that milky sap and all, it's perfectly safe to eat, believe it or not. Then later on in the year, as that milkweed grows up and becomes more of a mature plant, it's maybe around four feet high at this stage. And in early summer, it gets these little flower bud clusters on them and very distinct. And you can see those little flower bud clusters on the tops of the plants and sometimes in the margins of the leaves and very distinct as you can see, but you can, you can steam those, you can saute those up. Um, you know, again, uh, once you cook them up, you, you, you can add something as simple as butter, a sprinkle of salt and maybe a touch of lemon, or you can pickle those florets and uh, make, make like a little caper substitute there with the pickled florets or milkweed bud casserole. There's a great recipe online for that. Um, so those milkweed buds you can use for a cream of milkweed soup. And they're, it, it's one of those uh, parts of the plant that you don't wanna blanch it too long again, or it'll turn to mush. You just blanch it maybe 30 seconds to a minute. And then you can, again, put it in a skillet and, and you know stir fry it a little bit with, uh, you know, some uh, garlic and salt and pepper and, and you're good to go. So the milkweed flower florets are delicious and tasty. You can eat them raw as well. They're actually uh, very sweet. And then later on, you can see the flower bud cluster here in the left part of this image and then uh, a cluster right next to it that is opened up into full flower. Again, they're fragrant, they're delicious. You can eat them raw, top them into salads, you know, kind of make your salad look all pretty for a wild edible salad feast. And it's one of these flowers, you can cut them off with the scissors so they just kind of become individual florets. And you can keep them in the refrigerator or in a plastic bag or container and they'll last for weeks. And one of the few flowers that you can actually cut and keep in the refrigerator and have it last that long, which is a pretty cool thing. So you can make a, a flower cordial out of that, which is a basically you're making a simple syrup and you're adding the flowers to that simple syrup. And it's very colorful and delicious. You can drizzle that over your ice cream. Uh, you can use it, uh, substitute vinegar for all parts of the water in the syrup for savory uses. And uh, then those, uh, those fruity aromas are very soluble in the solutions that have vinegar in them. So that floral note that you smell in the flower actually transfers much easier in the vinegar type solution. And, uh, you know, you can make some great condiments out of that. And so here's uh, the, uh, the flowers that were used to make a simple syrup and then, you know, add a little effervescent soda and uh, some ice cubes and you have a delicious uh, milkweed flower seltzer uh, to enjoy. Um, and, and then the, the milkweed flowers uh, can also be uh, used uh, in, in other uh, condiments as well. And then uh, again, you can uh, add um, vinegar to this and, and make a simple syrup. Um, and pour that over fruit salad or goat cheese. Um, I have not done this yet, but uh, from what I find it, it tastes a little bit like strawberries. And, uh, and if you don't really heat up the vinegar, you just basically put it in a warm spot and let the sunlight kind of leach out the flavor, much like you would sun tea. Uh, and then you just strain that mixture and you've got a wonderful uh, milkweed flour uh, cordial, good stuff. But really one of my favorite ways to use the flowers uh, is to make a fritter batter. And a fritter batter is very easy to make. And uh, Kay Young has a great recipe for this in her uh, book, Wild Seasons. That's where I learned about it. And uh, basically uh, covering the flowers with that fritter batter and then putting them in hot peanut oil uh, and then frying them up to their golden brown, dust it with a little powdered sugar. It tastes florally, fragrant, sweet, and delicious. Uh, you can't go wrong. Just make sure it's the common milkweed because uh, if you're choosing another milkweed, uh, they can be toxic. So the common milkweed is the one you need to learn uh, in order to do that. But then later on, after those flowers, you're not going to want to harvest all the flowers, right? Because you want the plant to be able to produce seeds. So you need to find a, a large enough patch where you're not harvesting all of the flowers from the plant, right? You're taking some here and there. 
And it's kind of a snack item anyway, so it's not like you need to harvest the whole patch. But later on in the year, uh, these uh, pods will form. And when you kind of press against the pods and they're still really hard, that's the time to collect them. If you wait too long and you kind of squeeze that pod, they become kind of spongy and soft. Uh, they're past their prime, so, you, so it's too late for you to harvest. You'll have to wait till next year. But again, when they're young, about maybe an inch to an inch and a half, they're hard. And then you can kind of see the lines along this pod. You can just basically take your thumb and your forefinger and split that pod open naturally, really easy to find the goodies inside. And those goodies inside, you can eat fresh or cook up, mild tasting, tender and delicious and surprisingly sweet. I haven't tried the fried milkweed pods yet, but it's definitely on my bucket list. You know, you just dredge them a little buttermilk and then, uh, you know, dust them in cornmeal and then fry them like just like you would okra, right? Uh, tasty, tasty dish. But uh, there you can kind of see the little pods against my fingers there, those little one inch pods. And like I say, you can let them get up maybe about an inch and a half. Um, but, but it's interesting, milkweed contains papain, which is the same natural enzyme as the papaya. And that is used as a meat tenderizer. So it cuts the protein change in the fibrils and also in the connective tissue, disrupting in the structural integrity of the muscle fiber and tenderizing the meat. Basically, it's a natural meat tenderizer. So Native Americans would often boil uh, uh, buffalo meat. They would cook buffalo meat and put these uh, milkweed pods right in with them to tenderize the meat. How cool is that? And if you look up meat, natural meat tenderizer from the store, that's made from guava. And guava is or the papaya and that's uh, where you get that natural enzyme papain which is the same enzyme that's in milkweed how cool is that right so anyway it's it's also a mild soothing effect on the stomach and aids in protein digestion so anyway here's where you can kind of see that natural split as you're opening that pod and there's the developing seed clusters inside and you can pull that inner part out so these are cooked pods I pull that inner part out and then you can kind of take this inner part, eat them fresh. It, like I say, it's surprisingly sweet and delicious, or you can kind of saute it up uh, with other ingredients, you know, add it to whatever you're cooking that night or just saute it up on the skillet a very short time, a little garlic, uh, you know, salt, pepper, and you're good to go, olive oil, whatever turns you on. So there's some sauteed milkweed pods. Those are tasty, or I've actually pickled the milkweed pods too. And I know a friend of mine really enjoyed those and said it's one of the best pickles he's ever had. So lots of versatile use for the milkweed pods. And then later on in the season, so here you see the flower bud clusters on there. And then at the very top of the plant, you know, the leaves are too big to really enjoy this, this time of year. But at the very top of the plant, you've got these little one inch leaves, maybe two inches at the most. You can actually snip off the very tops of these plants right up until the, 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 the first freeze of the year, take those much like you would do uh, uh, with sage leaves, you know, where you, you gently saute them in some olive oil to make them crispy. Uh, you can do the same thing with milkweed leaves and they're, they're mild and tasty and a great addition to any dish, kind of topping it off with those, those crispy milkweed leaves. So the milkweed is an amazing, versatile plant for the wild forager. Get to know it. You'll be glad you did. Okay, now we're going to move on to cacti. And I put this in here because not necessarily in eastern Nebraska, but certainly out in the sand hills and the panhandle, they have the big red prickly pear cactus all over the place. And that picture in the upper left was a former garden I used to have. So it's very easy for you to grow in the garden. And you may wanna say, why would I wanna grow this in the garden? You know, it, it'll jump out and bite me. Well, not unless you run into it, right? And they have beautiful flowers and then they have these pads, right? And these pads uh, can be collected and eaten. And if you're paying attention to uh, any markets, specialty markets, whether it be a Mexican market or some of our local markets, uh, they'll sell these pads in the grocery store and maybe you've wondered what can I do with those there's lots of great recipes online on using cactus pads which are called nopales in Mexico and uh, great recipes but if you cut open one of these pads 
they have a mucilaginous juice, almost like a slimy juice, like, like aloe vera. If you can think of what the juice of aloe vera is like, that mucilaginous juice was utilized as a sizing to fix the color paint on hides. So if you, if you uh, colored your horse's hide, you'd want that paint to, to be, you know, to stick to the animal. So if it rains, it doesn't wash all that, that natural dye off. They would basically smear the uh, mucilaginous juice of the cactus pads over this dyed portion of the, the hide. And uh, that, would, that would fix the, the, the color paint on the hide. Pretty cool. It was also rubbed onto moccasins as a natural waterproofing. So if you think about it, a cactus growing in desert-like conditions, it's also a water storage organ. So it's storing all that water in that cactus pad for overcoming droughts, right? So if you're smart and you're a plant, you're gonna cover yourself with spines so uh, the desert creatures don't eat you to death, right? So it's basically a, a safety mechanism for the plant so all the critters don't eat it. But what often happens with cactus, well, it does happen with cactus. Here on the right, you can see these newly developing pads. And these pads, as they're developing, these little uh, green uh, projectiles you see on there don't have any spines on them yet. So that's the best time to collect them in spring when the, the last winter's pad is, is developing new pads because they're often spineless. Now to be safe, you can easily remove those spines with a butter knife. You can cook them first and then those spines just kind of rub off with a butter knife. Or you can collect a pad like this and cut away that top section of spines uh, just with the scissors and then remove these other parts uh, again after it's cooked very easily with a butter knife. Once it's cooked, they just they slide right off. And then you can uh, handle these cactus pad with salad tongs. That's probably the easiest way to handle them so you're not touching them with your hands is using salad tongs. And there you kind of see the spines kind of cut away and you're, and you're ready to, uh, to utilize your nopales or your, uh, your cactus pads. And uh, I like this description, they're crunchy, they're tart. Think of them as a lemony green bean is what they kind of taste like. Uh, you can pickle them, you can dry them and then reconstitute them for soups and stews. They're great grilled or cooked up, chopped up and added fresh to salsas or salads. But I think in my opinion, the best flavor, the best use for them is grilling them. And I've actually grilled them over an open fire where you basically, you're seeing here, these lines are score lines. So you're scoring these lines with a knife, not cutting all the way through, but that allows that mucilaginous juice to kind of come out and ooze out of the plant and dehydrate as the plant is being roasted over the grill. And then that roasting gives it a very uh, wonderful flavor as well. You can dry that and it's a fantastic way to preserve your harvest. If you have them in your yard or forage for them, the young paddles only come out once a year, as I said. So getting them early in the spring, then you can cut them into little pieces and dehydrate them. That also eliminates that mucilaginous juice. Uh, so that's one good thing to overcome. And so when you eat the raw ones, you wanna toss them in a fine sea salt for about 10 to 20 minutes. And once you toss them in that sea salt, uh, you know, like a, a table or spoon for each large paddle, uh, you let that sea salt kind of pull out uh, that, that mucilaginous juice. And, and, you know, so you put them in a colander and let them drain uh, with that sea salt and then wash them really well to get the salt off and to remove even more of that mucilaginous juice. Then you can apply that, like you see in this picture, as a salad. So these are cooked Nepalese, not fresh, um, and then added to the salad. And uh, my Mexican friend turned me onto this. I really love, uh, it's kind of a grilled cheese sandwich, Mexican version of it, where they take uh, nopales or cooked cactus pads. These are roasted cactus pads and made into a grilled cheese sandwich. And I must say it is very tasty and well worth the effort for you to, uh, to make. I highly encourage you to uh, include nopales in your diet. You can actually purchase uh, pickled uh, cactus pads in the store. Uh, or you can make your own pickled uh, nopales uh, to keep in the refrigerator for weeks on end. You can use these pickled nopales in salads, pizzas, nachos, burritos, omelets, lots of different uses for those. And then later on the cactus, the flowers will form this beautiful reddish purple fruit on the tips of the cactus pads. 
And these are, are, are beautiful and tasty. You can see these little um, glaucids, they're called. They're like little miniature spines. Uh, if you touch those with your thumb, they can kind of get in your skin and be irritating. But if you put your thumb in the top little portion of here on the top and bottom, they rub off very easily, again, with a butter knife. Um, easy to do. You can eat them fresh. You can prepare them. And what you can see, once you cut them in half, you have this flesh here. And then in the center part, there's a lot of seeds. So you can basically eat the thing whole like this and then just kind of spit out the seeds, which is kind of fun to do. So uh, what's cool about this is the juice then can be trans uh, made into a simple syrup. I've made um, prickly pear cactus fruit jelly before. It makes the beautifully the beautiful jelly. You can make this simple syrup and you see the simple recipe down here below uh, and, and use it in cocktails, club soda, lemonade, iced tea, hot tea, water, whatever. Uh, they're very versatile and very tasty. And there you see some jelly I made with it. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a cactus fruit a mojito. Uh, you can make candies out of them, uh, ice cream. I mean, the list goes on and on of different uses for the prickly pear cactus fruit. Okie doke. So hopefully you're turned on to cacti. <laughs> now the common burdock. So the burdock is a weed of Nebraska, uh, borderline invasive in a lot of areas in Nebraska. It was brought over from across the pond as food stuff and for its uh, medicinal uses for uh, its root, its stalk is generally the areas of the plant that are used and uh, lots of great information on common burdock on how good it is for us. But maybe you've seen this, uh, you know, growing in your garden as a weed. Um, and kind of said it kind of looks like rhubarb, but not quite, but the leaves get huge, you know, maybe about two feet long and a foot across. So pretty hard to, to not recognize burdock uh, if you have it in your yard. But one thing burdock does is it's a biennial. So the first year you'll just get this big basil rosette. And then the following year, it'll send up the stalk above that basil rosette and flower. So if I'm gonna be harvesting the root, I wanna get it in that first year stage, let it grow up like this. And then in the fall, I would dig that plant and harvest the root. If I do it on the second year plant, that root is, is too stiff, too, too uh, unpalatable to eat. It's, it's edible, but it's unpalatable at that stage. So you just kind of got to keep an eye on a patch. And in the fall, when you see it with no flowering stalk, you know it's a first year plant, right? And then you just dig up those roots and, and here's the root there. You can kind of see a close up of the root and uh, they, you can actually uh, uh, purchase that. Uh, I purchased it at uh, some Oriental markets here in Lincoln. Uh, it's called Gobo in China. And you can, uh, you can peel it, slice it, eat it raw with a little sea salt, uh, have it in stir fries, which I've done before. And the, the, the young shoots, the peeled stalks and the dried seeds can carry numerous compounds that known to have antioxidant, disease preventing and health promoting properties. And indeed at, at uh, places like, um, well, health food stores and whatnot, you can get uh, seed, uh, burdock seed tinctures and uh, I've never made the tincture before, but it's something that's on our bucket list and uh, plan on doing that because again, for its health promoting properties, it's really good for you. So there's the flowering stalk uh, coming up here. It was harvested and then cut into pieces. And the, uh, the, that central flowering stalk is probably the best thing to eat. Um, it kind of resembles that of an artichoke. You peel away the, the tough outer green layer and that inner part is what you want of the stalk. Uh, and, and as you can see here, it can be served as a simple side. It can be uh, made into a salad, soup, egg dish, layered with bechamel and sauce and cheese, topped with breadcrumbs and baked. It's just a very versatile uh, food item. But if you harvest it and there's a hole in the center, the stalk will likely be uh, too tough. So you just keep cutting the stalk down until you reach a point where there's no longer a hole in the center and then you'll have reached that tender portion of it. So if, you, if you're cutting into the stalk, you've either waited too long. And again, if you're at a patch of burdock, you tend to have a lot of stalks. So a lot of choices to choose from, then you just peel it away. But uh, carduni is a, a, a dish made um, in Italy. 
and it basically has uh, cooked and cooled burdock stems, and then you make uh, basically it mix it up with eggs and breadcrumbs, a little green onion, sprinkle of Parmesan cheese, make them into little patties, and then fry them up. I've never tried Carduni yet, but it's definitely on our wish list because again, burdock is very nutritious and good for you. Okay, so we'll move on from a weed that was introduced to America to one that is actually native to America. The Jerusalem artichoke is not from Jerusalem, nor is it an artichoke, but is actually native to Nebraska. It is a sunflower, the Helianthus tuberosa. So all the sunflowers are in the genus Helianthus. So here's what the plant looks like. It has a flower, just like a sunflower, you know, attractive leaves. But what you're harvesting out of the uh, Jerusalem artichoke is the root, the tuber. And one of the other common names, probably more appropriate for this plant is sunchokes rather than Jerusalem artichoke. If, if you Google uh, recipes using sunchokes, a lot of great recipe ideas for you. I know there's a lot of words here, but it's just interesting that Here's a plant that was first cultivated by Native Americans long before the arrival of Europeans. And the French explorer Samuel de Champlain found domestically grown plants in Cape Cod in 1605, right? And then they brought the plant back home to France and by the mid 1600s had become a very common vegetable in Europe and the Americas and was also used for livestock feed in Europe and colonial America. So it's interesting, the French in particular especially are fond of it. And it kind of reached its peak in the 19th century, but now is kind of uh, lost favor. Very few people are familiar with this plant. And quite honestly, I don't know of a place in the nature, in the wild, where I can go collect it. I grow this in my garden. Um, you just have to be very cautious about where you grow it in your garden because it's very aggressive. Anyway, the, the tubers of this plant are very high in inulin. And inulin is a type of starch, although not digestible by humans, it acts as a prebiotic in our digestive tract, feeding our beneficial bacteria. So it's become widely used uh, filler in many foods to bump up the fiber counts. That sounds great, right? It also increases calcium absorption in the body and it doesn't uh, spike uh, blood sugar. So um, for, for the, the prebiotics, which we need just as much as the probiotics, this is an awesome plant. So there you see what the tubers look like. Uh, if you were to dig it up and remove the soil, these are water storage organs as well. So again, it's for the plant to overcome uh, drought conditions. Very easy plant to grow, very tough. But again, those tubers are aggressive. They will spread in your garden and, and, uh, and you know not play nice with other plants. So there you can kind of see it's also called earth apples, sun root, sun chokes. So the only issue with eating a large amount of sun chokes, just like we eat a large amount of anything, it can cause some gas problems for some folks. And I can testify to that after eating too many sun chokes, you know, <laughs> that horrible gut racking gas like you've never experienced before. Yeah, kind of like that. But I think it's just because your body's not used to digesting inulin, much like when you eat beans, if you're not eating beans often enough, those are the folks that tend to get more gas problems than those that eat beans uh, like daily or you know three times a week versus once a month, right? So uh, that's what the plant looks like uh, growing in the garden. It's very tall, uh, full grown. The plant will be about eight feet tall and then topped with those beautiful sunflowers, which pollinators love, by the way. But yeah, what you're basically looking is, is a species of sunflower. And so, yeah, as, as I say there, they attracts pollinating insects with that beautiful flower. And here's that, that warning about not planting it in a standard garden. Um, you will spend very large amounts of time attempting to remove them if you do, even if you harvest, all, try to harvest all the tubers every fall, because that's what you wanna do. You let the plant kind of uh, freeze back and then you dig up those tubers after the plant has gone dormant. I'm often digging my first tubers in November before the ground freezes, even right up around Thanksgiving. And then I will turn around and harvest them again in late winter. And uh, if you do have uh, digestive issues with the inulin and sunchokes, digging them in March, late winter, before they, they start emerging in the spring, digging them that early in the spring, um, that, that doesn't have nearly as much of the uh, gas producing compounds than if you harvested it in the fall. But the great thing about it is you can go out 
for that night's meal right in your backyard and say, uh, what can I harvest out of my garden in November, right? Sunchokes, and you'll be glad you did. There's actually a source online. These are images from Oikos tree crops. That's O-I-K-O-S. And Oikos is out of Kalamazoo, Michigan. And he actually sells uh, up to, I think, six different varieties of sunchokes. Some are reddish. Some you can see have brown skin and kind of more your standard sunchoke look is right there. They're, they're kind of like a, a water chestnut meets a jicama as far as eating them raw and somewhat nutty flavor, stir fried, sauteed, I've had them. Don't bother boiling them and mashing them like, like mashed potatoes. It's just not gonna do the plant justice. I think the best way I've ever had them is just roasted whole. These weren't even peeled, rich and sweet, slight, slightly chewy, kind of an interesting flavor, uh, very earthy flavor. And uh, you'll be glad you tried them, include them on your wild edible uh, plant list. There you see some lemon roasted Jerusalem artichokes, uh, just a raw there with a sunchoke pear and blue cheese salad. And one of the best uses for sunchokes is pickled sunchokes. I have friends that make those every year. They're tasty and delicious and uh, well worth the easy effort of making pickled sunchokes. Love them. And there's some sunchokes I sauteed up with some wild edible oyster mushrooms. Great combination together. Tasty and delicious and good for you. Okay, now let's move on to cattails. Cattails is a plant I first learned about when I was a kid. My uncle uh, taught me, my dad, uh, and others about cattail shoots. The whole plant is edible. Again, palatable is another thing. But uh, the cattail had a, a huge use amongst Native Americans. It was used to make dressings for burns and scalds. So, so that, that fluff that you see that cattails produce, that was often put on a, a burn or a scalding or, or open wounds uh, as kind of a mother nature's band-aid. If you were a medicine man, you always, always had cattail fluff in your medicine bag. It was also used on infants to prevent chafing, much as Lee would use talcum powder today. And, and picture the cradle boards uh, that you've seen images of, of Native Americans using. They, they filled pillows and the padding for those cradle boards and, and baby wrappings, um, even baby diapers. A great quantity of down was collected in which to lay a newborn infant. So if uh, somebody was in labor and expecting, they would go out and collect uh, a great uh, meal, uh, a, amount of that or have it on hand. So, you know, when they were having a baby, you know, off season, they had it on hand um, for that new infant to be laid in. So in early summer, you can basically go up to a patch of, of cattails and pull on that stalk. And that stalk will actually break away from the root system. And inside that stalk, you can kind of peel the outer leaves away and you're left with this white inner portion of the plant, that's the part you wanna eat. So you basically just cut away those, those top portions. Now this part is edible, it's just not palatable because it's just too tough, too sinewy to eat. But these white bases are tender and delicious and we would have them just kind of steamed and serve it up with little, little spices and, and butter. And uh, I thought they were really tasty even as a kid. Um, and so uh, cattail shoots, very uh, tasty and delicious. You could pickle them uh, to use them like that. But if you've ever noticed cattails when they're growing later on in the year, the, the part of the cattail that turns brown is in this upper right-hand picture here. That is the female portion of a cattail. And then the top portion of the cattail is this. This is the male pollen spike. And you can actually harvest that and cook it. And I've done that before, harvesting this green portion right here before it, it opens and, and releases its pollen. It's uh, called cattail corn. And if uh, put, putting your nose over it as you're steaming these, these male cattail shoots, uh, it smells just like corn on the cob. It's really wild. And quite honestly, they were pretty dry. I don't know if I did something wrong, but it, I kind of said, you know, it's probably not something I'm gonna make in the future, but I would encourage you to check it out, look into it, and then you can decide for yourself if it's something to include in your, in your wild edible feasting. Plus it, it makes you pay attention to just how cool 
the cattail plant is. So there's the male portion that you saw right here that was still green. As it matures, the pollen comes out of that, that male portion of the cattail shoot and then you kind of tap your finger against that, that pollen falls off. And what you can do is just kind of bend that over into a five gallon bucket and just kind of tap that stem on the side of the bucket and that pollen will fall out. And literally off of one stalk like this, you can get like a teaspoon of pollen. It's amazing how much pollen comes off of that. And in Kay Young's Wild Seasons book, she has a great recipe that she calls golden pancakes. You generally mix it half and half with flour because it's, uh, you know, you need the flour to, for that rising of the pancake or for that rising of the cake, or whatever you're making out of it. So it's pretty fun to go out and collect the pollen of it. I will warn you when you when you put it over into a five gallon bucket and then you collect a bunch of pollen like that and then you look at your bucket, you'll see a lot of little insects in there. So you kind of panic at first going, how am I gonna get rid of all these bugs? If you put that pollen out on open newspaper, or whatever, just like this, those bugs exit the scene stage left. I mean, they're, they're out of there. They don't stick around. So that is the cattail, a very versatile, wild edible plant. Just be conscientious where you're catching, the, uh, collecting the cattail. If you're collecting the shoots, you wanna make sure you're not collecting the shoots from contaminated water or water that would have pesticides in it because of course the plant is gonna be absorbing those nasty chemicals. So the best thing you can do is collect cattails from a natural system or better yet, have a water garden where you're growing your own cattails and then you have your food source out there. Okay, well, we'll talk about yucca and how many people realize that yucca blossoms are actually edible. So this is the soapweed, our native yucca plant that grows naturally in the sand hills and in the panhandle of Nebraska. Those uh, yucca blossoms make an excellent side dish. You can saute them up. I've had them just raw right off the plant. It's kind of fun to pull off one of those flowers and eat it right in front of a friend because they kind of give you that twisted eye look like, seriously, you're going to eat that, dude? So they're, they're actually rather tasty. Uh, I would recommend sauteing them up. Just, you know, you can boil them for 30 minutes or saute them very short time. You know, it doesn't take a long time to cook a flower. But the, the, the flower stalk is what you're seeing here in the right. So this is the young shoot that's coming out of those uh, those sword-like leaves. So before the flowers develop on there, that's when you can harvest uh, that, that flower shoot and you can peel it, cut it into sections and, and cook it up just like you would cook up asparagus. And if you talk to ranchers out in the sand hills, they'll tell you that cattle go crazy eating the, uh, the flowering stalks of yucca. They really love it. That's oftentimes when you see in a sand hills pasture you know, sometimes it's like, well, why aren't the yucca blooming out there? Because the cows are eating those flowering stalks because they're such a delicacy to the cows. And of course, to us humans as well. Um, they call it soapweed because the root was soaked in water to make a sudsy soap. And then the fibers that you see come off the leaves were bound with sinew to make a fire drill. So that was the way they made a, a fire drill. So you can have that fire source on the treeless prairie. And then those fibers were also used as thread and the, the tip, uh, that, that needle-like tip uh, was used as, as the needle and thread. So pretty cool, uh, the uses of, uh, of the yucca plant. Okay, now let's uh, quickly talk about some trees, lots of different trees we can eat in uh, our wild edible collection. And here's the beautiful Eastern red bud, right? A native tree to Nebraska, native to the Southeastern portion of the state. Think of places like Indian Cave State Park. It grows naturally there. It grows in places like Wobunzi State Park in Iowa. And of course, we can grow it in our garden. So if you have Eastern red bud, uh, this spring, when you see it in bloom, remember this presentation, go out there and say, okay, I remember that, that nerd Bob said the flowers are edible. I'm just going to try them. And uh, you'll find that they're surprisingly sweet and tasty. You know, you can use the flowers, you know, over salads. You can, you can just graze on them. Um, yeah, kind of sweet with the lemony aftertaste. Uh, but they also make a very pretty jelly. Or uh, one common use for them is to pickle the flower buds like capers. So before the flowers open on a red bud, uh, here you can see them in the jar. Uh, these are the flower buds. So you collect them before they open and, and then put them in a, a, a pickling uh, 
a pickling sauce and, uh, you know, add some herbs to that or whatever. And as that vinegar pulls out the goodies of that red bud, you're, you're left with the, you know, you don't see it here because it was just made, but a very pretty uh, a pink vinaigrette, if you will, or salad dressing base uh, using red bud flowers. But later on, after the flowers are done, they produce young seed pods. And red buds, if you didn't guess, are a legume. They're in the pea family. And if you look at this, huh, kind of looks like sugar snap peas, right? Well, they're, they're like snow peas in texture. You want to get them when they're young and tender. If you wait too long, you know, they're still edible, edible, but they're very tough and sinewy. So getting them young when they're still tender, you can eat them fresh off the tree to kind of say, okay, I'm ready to collect, or you can cook them up in stir fry soups, stews, or you can blanch them and freeze them for use throughout the year. So those young peat seed pods are tasty and nutritious as well. And then the mature seeds later on when those pods mature, you can open that pod and inside the pod are these, uh, are these little seeds. And uh, those seeds are very uh, tasty and good for you. And if you've ever noticed birds love eating red bud seeds, I think they know how nutritious they are. And uh, I have not partaken in this yet, but it's on my to-do list of roasting a bit of them in, in coconut oil, adding a little sea salt and having a little red bud seed snack, but they're high in protein and, uh, and, and linoleic acid, and uh, which is uh, um, a good substance for us, for our health benefits. Another tree that you can go that you may not realize has edible parts to it is the Siberian elm. Now we could eat the American elm as well, but I wanna pick on the Siberian elm because it's another tree that was introduced in Nebraska and has become a very invasive species. It was introduced in our windbreaks as another tree to grow in our windbreaks. But if you know the Siberian elm, it has seeded itself all over the place to become an invasive species. Well, what better way to keep an invasive species in control than to eat its developing seeds, right? So those, those elm seeds that grow in clusters on the tree, they're actually on the tree in these clusters before the leaves even come out very early in the spring and you would harvest these when they're young and tender like this and you can eat them fresh or you can cook them up. They're uh, very mild in flavor, I would, I would describe as. Yeah, and a homemade pasta akin to spinach pasta uh, is a great way to use them. But there's where you can see the clusters on the branches even before the leaves occur. That would be a great time uh, to harvest your elm samaras. And uh, again, I, I, the only thing I've done is uh, eating them fresh off the tree, but I'm telling you they're tasty enough where you should put this on your wild edibles wish list. And again, help keep this invasive species in control by eating it up, <laughs> if you will. Um, yeah, and you can, you, when the trees go to seed, you can gather them and plant them in good soil and you can harvest them just like you would an alfalfa sprout. So think about that, you can go and harvest these clusters after they mature and grow them with the idea that you're gonna just collect those new shoots, those new germinating shoots, just like you would uh, uh, any other sprout. And they're delicious in salad, or you can just grab a handful and eat them fresh. How cool is that, right? So you can make your own homemade sprouts by using these uh, elm samaras. Okay, oaks, I'd be remiss not talking about acorns. Um, acorns used to feed the world. Um, acorn flour goes back thousands of years. We need to get back to utilizing this wonderful product that the oak trees make for us. Uh, this is a picture of swamp white oak acorns uh, in the upper left and bur oak acorns there in the lower right. Uh, the white oak family has less tannins. And these tannins, if you, if you would break open and crack open this, uh, this hard outer shell of an acorn, the nut meat inside, if you ate it fresh, is certainly edible, but you're gonna wanna spit it out right away because it's gonna be very bitter and astringent. What astringent does is it kind of gives you the, the, the dry pasties, if you will. Uh, you know, it kind of takes away all of your saliva and it's just like no fun to eat. So you have to basically get rid of the tannins before you can make acorn flour. And acorns um, are, are very good for us. They can contain a large amount of protein, carbohydrates, fats, uh, minerals, vitamins, 
So acorn flour is something we need to all get back to. So you can remove that tannic acid by what is called leaching. And that the best way to remove the tannins, you can do the hot method or the cold method is what most recommend. And some great information on there online. Uh, this is just kind of the shortened version of it. You know, you can take, you know, your, you, you, the nut meat inside and then uh, add some water to that and blend it in your Vitamix and uh, change that water frequently. And, uh, you know, once you grind it up into a, a fine uh, mesh, then you can pour it into one of those uh, strainer bags. And those strainer bags, you can get uh, often at brewing places, like uh, places that sell wine brewing or beer brewing products. These strainer bags are big and easy. And then you just put that bag over the top of that and drop those, those strained uh, nut meats right into that bag. And then, uh, you know, put it in a uh, container like this and pour water in there, let it sit, and then strain that water, you know, uh, several times a day up to around a week. So that water kind of runs clear. And then you can just kind of sample some of it and see uh, if that, that the tannins have kind of, how tasty is it? And it'll basically be pretty bland for you. Um, another way is just the cold method where you're just, you know, again, grinding up that nut meat putting it in a jar, adding water, and then that water will kind of leach out those tannins and you'll see kind of this yellowish brown color in the water. You just carefully pour that water off, refill it with water and replace the jar in the refrigerator. And you just do that several times again till the water's almost clear or you're tasting some of that meal uh, to see if it's still holding that those bitter compounds. Then after that final leaching, that's when you're ready to process it. You let those nut meats kind of air dry a little bit before you grind it or blend it in a food processor. And once it's ground for flour, you can cook it immediately or uh, freeze it to store it. And acorn flour doesn't have gluten in it, so it won't rise. So oftentimes acorn flour recipes um, add half acorn flour and half regular flour because uh, the, the regular flour will give you that you know, gluten and, and you know, your pancakes will actually rise. But I've had acorn flour pancakes before, which again is half acorn flour, half regular flour. And if you've ever had buckwheat pancakes before, they, they're, they're delicious, uh, more hearty and good for you. Acorn flour adds a richness and a depth uh, to those pancakes or whatever you're cooking with it, muffins, cookies, uh, that, uh, that is really unlike any other. So get to know the acorn and put that on your bucket list, making yourself acorn flour. Just remember, you want to go with the white oak group. So red oaks tend to have uh, uh, more bitter acorns. So the, the, the burr oak, the swamp white oak are probably your best species to choose from. Okay, common hackberry of all plants. Uh, the hackberry, here it is growing naturally in Wilderness Park. The hackberry forms these little, uh, you know, think of these things as nuts more than berries because they have a a thin coating on surrounding this, this hard nut inside. And uh, the, the fruit uh, is high in protein, fat, and minerals. And uh, it's, it's got a long history of nourishing us humans. In fact, we found hackberry fruits in Paleolithic caves. It goes back that, that long ago. But I think we've all kind of got away from uh, using hackberries in our food. You, you know, here in the left is a, a picture more of it in late fall as the, after the leaves drop, that's a good time to collect. But uh, they say in literature, collecting them when they just turn red is the best time because they're more juicy, they're not as dry. But you can smash the berries, seed and all in a mortar and pestle. And then you can take that sweet sticky mash and mix it with ground nuts dehydrated fruit and form your own wild energy bar. And it can be stored at room temperature and, and it makes an excellent wild uh, nature food. Oh, darn it. I'm seeing I'm out of time, Brianna. <laughs> anyway, uh, if that, it's kind of got a gritty texture and you can make what's called hackberry milk. And you basically take those berries and grind it up in your Vitamix and then strain it and, and make a, a tasty, delicious drink. Uh, that has none of that gritty quality to it. And, uh, or you can make, take this milk and, and uh, use it for cooking as well. So hackberry milk is, is tasty and delicious.
the final tree I'll talk about, and then we'll just kind of end it there and uh, go to a couple of questions I see in the chat. Silver maple samaras, uh, those, those seed pods of the maple, as they just drop off the tree, you can see they're kind of brown. If you peel open that samara, they have a green portion inside of there that you can roast uh, and turning them super nutty. Eating them fresh, they're a little bitter, kind of like tannin bitter like the acorns, but once you uh, cook them up or roast them, they become very crunchy and tasty and uh, they can be added on tops of salads, uh, other uses for them. But uh, again, the best way to do those maple seeds is by roasting them. And if you know silver maple, it can seed rather prolifically in, an, in a good year. And so what better way to, to reduce the invasiveness of silver maple by, a, no, it's not an invasive species, mind you, but it can uh, kind of seed around a little too much. So it's a good way to utilize uh, all those different maples out there. So Brianna, I see we're at eight o'clock, so I better stop there. And just as I suspected, we could probably have a round three of wild edible plants. I have that much <laughs> left that I could talk about, believe it or not. There's so many plants, so little time. Man, well, I could listen to you all night, not gonna lie. So I love <laughs> this, I'm eating it up. Um, Molly had some really awesome things to say when about the oak tree and the elm, really helpful, loved those. Um, earlier, um, we did have a question about milkweed and if it was poisonous. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Sorry, earlier we had a question and you kind of covered it, um, but again, just to reiterate, somebody asked if milkweed was poisonous or toxic. Yeah, great question. You know, that, that milky sap, you know, when I'm out cutting uh, those milkweed pods, when I'm when I'm snipping off those shoots, you'll definitely see that latex sap. And often, what I do is I'll I'll snip off the shoots and kind of let them bleed off that sap a little bit. But once you cook them, that that you know, eating them raw is different. That's why you need to cook them. But I can tell you, just eating snacking on those young milkweed leaves that you harvest later on in the year, I've eaten them fresh. I mean, obviously you're not gonna to wanna to eat a pound of fresh milkweed leaves, right? Just a little bit of a snack. But, but again, cooking them renders it useless. Some authorities will say that when you're cooking those milkweed shoots, maybe boiling them or blanching them to change that water up to three times. Um, and other authorities I've read saying, I've never you know, changed the water three times and then boiled them to, to get that milky sap. It's the, the toxicity has not been an issue once it's cooked. So, and then the flowers, those milkweed flowers don't have any of the toxicity. Um, again, you would have to eat it fresh for it to be a problem. Perfect. And we do have another question. Do we need to worry about over harvesting? Uh, like a milkweed or I uh, imagine. I think Probably. just in general of, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, focusing on the milkweed because I, I'm sure folks are worried about, well, you, wait a minute though, milkweed's kind of like really becoming an issue because it's the larval food source of the monarch butterfly, right? And I would say like for me personally, I have a milkweed patch. So I'm like, well, I grew this patch. It's my baby, right? And so I can go out there and harvest maybe a quarter of, of the food stuff that's available to me, right? So I'm not over harvesting at any one patch, you know, cause you wanna save some flowers for the pollinators. You wanna save the pods so it can produce new seeds for new plants, right? So you're not going out there and harvesting all the part of that. That's why the milkweed shoot is such a great thing to harvest because you're harvesting that young shoot as it's emerging in the spring. So just by snipping off the top portion of that plant, you're not digging it up, right? So the plant just sends up new shoots and recovers perfectly without you doing any harm to the plant whatsoever. Awesome, and we do have a couple more questions. I'm gonna throw um, the poll back up for you guys. Um, this is the last one, um, but if you guys answer this one and you answered the pre poll <laughs> You are entered to win a $25 gift card, just to remind you, so answer that. And then our next question, Martin asked, there are pear cactus, red and green. Have you found a red pear cactus here? Hmm. 
pear cactus that's red and green. And I'm not sure what species the pear cactus is, if that's, if that's the same thing as the prickly pear. I'm assuming that's what he's talking about, the prickly pear cactus. And, and you can go ahead and, and, and answer that in the chat if you want. But, but yeah, the, uh, from what I understand, yeah, the prickly pear that grows naturally here, the ones we would grow in our gardens as the big root prickly pear, uh, those fruits are always purplish red. And you may be seeing the fruits when they're still in the immature stage, right? So it would be green. And then you just want to wait for them to turn that, that beautiful, rich, purplish red color because that's, it, it turns very sweet. And I'll never forget uh, my young kids, they were probably only waist high. We are at this little patch of prickly pear and I uh, wish I would have got a picture of that. My four kids <laughs> eating prickly pear cactus fruit fresh on the side of the road uh, just as a snack uh, because they're tasty and delicious. And I think the kids enjoyed much like eating watermelon when you spit the seeds at your buddy. Uh, yeah, they were spitting the seeds uh, at each other. So <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> Funny. Um, Angelina, you did have your hand raised. Do you have a question? And if not, um, we can wait a second. Um, we do have another question from Rachel. She said, where can I buy native plants to add to my garden? Yeah, great question, Rachel. You know, one, there's there's a number of great sources. And in Lincoln, you know, I work for the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum, and we've been selling prairie plants as long as I've been here. I arrived in 2000, and uh, we're a great source for, for native plants to put in your garden. Uh, we have plant sales starting with Spring Affair and other other uh, options, just follow us on Facebook is the probably the easiest way. Either type in Nebraska State Water Arboretum and you'll find out when those sales are. Another great source uh, right here in Lincoln is Midwest Natives. Um, Midwest Natives does a great job and sells a, a wide variety of prairie plants for you to include in your garden as well. So those are two great sources. Kind of my Bible that I first started ordering prairie plants or seeds from is Prairie Moon Nursery up in Minnesota, but you can now order seeds in Nebraska. You could just type in uh, native prairie seeds for sale in Nebraska, but one source I really like is Prairie Legacy. Uh, Prairie Legacy Nursery uh, has started her operation collecting local ecotype prairie seeds. So she collects these seeds and then grows them in rows on her farm and then collects the seed from those locally collected uh, prairie plants uh, to get seeds to you and I. Love it. Um, man, our chat is blown up. We got some really cool. Um, Kylie said sauteing the yucca flour and garlic and olive oil and salad. Delicious. Nice. I always like hearing that, that other people have tried this stuff. I just think that's awesome. Because sometimes you can say, oh, it's tasty. And then it's like, you know, you hope somebody's not nodding. I guess, sure it is, right? <laughs> so it's nice to hear other people uh, echo that sentiment. And one thing I have to admit, Brianna, is, is the questions I asked, unfortunately, I didn't even get to those plants to talk about. <laughs> so I'm looking at these questions and I don't know if we want to bother answering it for people now or. Might as well, yeah. And Angela, you keep raising your hand. Do you want to talk or no? <laughs> okay, I'll let you answer the questions, Bob, and then. Okay, very good. So the first one is, what is the name of the tree that is considered the world's leading anti-cold and anti-flu herb? Time's up. It is the American linden. But not just the linden here. I put down linden because we have the American linden, which is native to Nebraska. The big, it's a big leaf linden. But most of the lindens you see people plant in landscapes as, as a shade tree comes from Europe. It's called the little leaf linden. So that's what you're likely going to be collecting because it grows all over Lincoln and, and lots of towns in Nebraska. But the flowers of the linden have some amazing anti-cold, anti-flu benefits. So you can harvest the flowers, dry them, and then make a wonderful wintertime tea to help keep the fold, cold and flu bug away from you. 
and it is highly regarded. Lots of research done on this plant. I encourage you to look up health benefits of the linden. You'll be amazed uh, as the benefits this plant can provide us all. It's got an amazing history that goes back centuries. Uh, there's also a linden native to China. Um, and, and so the linden has made its way around this globe. Okay, so uh, different species of linden that's native to China, but nonetheless, it grows all over. So which wild edible shrub was honored by Native Americans for the month of July? They named a whole month after this plant. Uh, they respected it so much. The black cherry moon. Any ideas what might be forming a black cherry in July? So it was kind of a hint there. So the one you should all be collecting in July, folks, is the choke cherry. And the choke cherry was a, a plant they would collect. In fact, when it was choke cherry season, they would set up camp next to patches because they wouldn't all ripen at once, right? So if you hung out and gathered daily, new clusters would ripen daily. So they wanted to make sure they got a lot of the choke cherry. And it was ground whole, uh, seed and all, into a mash and mixed with buffalo fat, uh, which is question number three. Question number three is which wild edible plants were dried for winter use and mixed with buffalo meat and fat to make what's called pemmican. And pemmican was stored in caches over the winter. It's kind of like uh, wild uh, uh, nature trail bars, you know, that, that everybody touts nowadays. These were nature, nature bars that were made by Native Americans for centuries before we even came up with granola bars, people. And these had, again, wild edible plants and then wild fruits. And uh, there you see the three that were traditionally used most often. We just talked about the hackberry a little bit, ground, seed and all. And if you look up information on the hackberry, lots of great information to read about. Uh, it's an amazing superfood as well. Uh, but the service berry or June berry, choke cherry, hackberry, all three were made into pemmican. So that's your answers. <laughs> love it um again thank you so much bob and if you guys have any last minute questions oh one just popped in the chat box oh angelina um so are some position oh, i'm not sure what you're referring to um but yeah sorry um but yeah if you guys have any last minute questions throw them in the chat box otherwise again thank you so much bob you are just an encyclopedia of knowledge. I just, you blow my mind. Um, oh gosh, well, thank you. I, you know, I, I think it's like, I love plants and I love people. As I heard one person say, I just like to introduce them to each other. <laughs> That's too perfect. <laughs> and again, this is being recorded. So if you guys missed anything, want to rewatch it, share it. It will be on our Conservation Nebraska YouTube channel um, in just a couple weeks. Um, and check out our Facebook page for any other webinars and events we got going on. Got a lot of fun stuff coming up and maybe even Bob coming in with a third. We never know. <laughs> right. I, I have a feeling your mind's already turning on that because I can tell you, yeah, I didn't get done talking about all the plants. We didn't even talk about nut trees for the love of Pete, people. <laughs> what about what about choke cherries and elderberries and June berries and wild plums? And we haven't even gotten to those. And and I, and it's it's funny because when you're thinking about wild edible plants, that's probably the first thing that came to people's minds, right? What about elderberry? Well, we haven't even gotten to that yet. There's so many. It's not even funny. So many more delicious things out there to try. Uh, um, oh, Angelina said, are some poisonous? Again, I don't know which plant you're talking about. Sorry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and, and in general, Angelina, if you're asking, are some plants poisonous? Yes. Right. You know, just like anything, you want to make sure you're harvesting in an area where you have permission, right, or grow it in your backyard. Uh, you want to make sure you're harvesting in an area that's not uh, been oversprayed by chemicals, right, next to an ag field or something like that. So there's certainly precautions. You don't want to over harvest. And then the most important thing is make sure 100% sure you've identified the plant correctly. Awesome. And man, all the praise in the chat box. They're loving you tonight, Bob. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you tuning in. And to those of you that I know out there, hi. <laughs> and to the others as well, how's it growing? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Isaac Crow, and I love it. Well, have a great night, everybody. And again, thank you so much, Bob. You are just an incredible human, and we love having you. So. Oh, thank you so much. I enjoy doing it. Yes. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.